Welcome back for another episode of The Beat. Today, we are joined by a guest who needs no introduction. He's played all the biggest clubs, events and festivals all over the world for a number of years now. Massive releases on labels like Drum Code and Filth on Acid. And he's got the most recognizable beard in dance music. It's Will Clark. Thanks for joining us, mate. How you been? What's been happening? Nicely edited out the whole uh, Black Book rap. (laughs) (laughs) Don't have to tell them that one. (laughs) Have you been up to being a bit busy? Yeah, it's been amazing. It's obviously, I don't know when this podcast actually gets released, but it's December the 22nd. And yeah, it's been a crazy year. Been super lucky. Um, Yeah, it's it's been non, I think, I think I've had two weekends off all year, which has been crazy. Um, Yeah. Um, Which I'm also like super fortunate that that's happened. And yeah, it's just been. It's been a a year, a lot of change in the industry, a lot of change for me. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm really happy to be at the end of it, but also happy to like look back and be it be like my best year so far. Um, and musically, there's a lot of music coming out next year that I'm really excited about. And yeah, it's just just really exciting projects that we're working on, which is which is fun. Why would you say this year's been the best year so far? Um, I think it's like everything my team and I have like what we've been working towards since 2019 is like slowly coming to fruition. Um, which is still a long way down the line, but it's like at the start, obviously like COVID stunted it for a little bit, but we still kind of carried on with the plan during COVID and I think this year is the, the bounce back after COVID. I know you guys were a lot later and having shows back, but like the rest of the world was kind of open f- end of 2021. Um, so you had like the bounce back year, which was always going to be everyone going out and getting partying hard and kind of tickets selling out everywhere and things like that. And we kind of knew that that was going to be not real or not reality. Um, so going into 2022, I don't think anyone really knew what to expect. And the industry changed quite a lot with like ticket sales and how people buy tickets. Um, a lot of like pre-sales don't like pre-sales slowed down, but then people would buy very quickly, like the night of or the day, like two days before, Mm. um, which is like really worrying. But I think we had that since January. And like by the summer, we were like, okay, let's just get used to it now. Um, and accept that, yeah, like the likes of like Fish and the likes of like Chris Lake and the like the super big guys out there at the moment that like at the top of the game, like that, yeah, of course they sell out. But the likes of me where it's like not A list, it's like B, B, C list, like you're kind of like, you're still selling good tickets but it's just not that pre-sale which kind of worries everybody promoters get stressed agents get stressed which then goes into the manager and i'm like a massive like stats phobe so like every time i speak to my manager it's like where we have tickets where we have tickets Um, but yeah i think like it's just been a really strong year with with that and i was fortunate that like December last year, so 2021, I had my release on Trick came out. Um, and then it kind of just, it fell up, like it just fell on its ass really and didn't do anything. And then early, I think February, done like two months and it, it stopped streaming at like 250,000, which still is a good number for a, a record that's like just a club record. Um, but then it got picked up on a Spotify playlist and just was going mental for months and it still is going absolutely mental. And it's the record's just kind of like caught a life of its own, which is very strange to me, but it's just how it is. It's just, it's kind of a classic example of how the music industry is that you just never know which record is going to do well. And a record that I spend six months on, 
tweaking and you put it out and it does shit and then the record that I wrote literally in half an hour <laughs> does nearly 8 million streams in a year and you're like this is ridiculous for a record that doesn't even have a vocal or doesn't have anything that like you can kind of hook onto so you just never know um, so musically this year has been a strange one because I just haven't released as much um, but yeah that's changing next year so sure. how was that sort of period through COVID for you? Because obviously before that, you're out touring and playing these big parties and then yeah. obviously everything slows right down for you. So what was that time like for you? It was weird because we just launched our record label we have is now in 2020. And like we, Ryan and I, Ryan's my manager, if anybody didn't know this listening, um, we had plan the whole of 2019 pretty much we started working together like 2019 and the, from day one it was how do we plan a record label and how do we get the right team on board so the record label does well and the record label kind of gets to where we want it to get to and january 2020 we had like i did a huge tour like a, i think it was like a 20 22 day tour of America that was me open to close. Wow. Uh, and then we launched the first record, which was You Take Me Higher, like had crazy support, did amazing. Fish was playing at every show. We had Andrea Oliver do a remix. It was just like an insane start. And then the, the second record was Hallelujah. Um, track. Which, yeah. yeah. That's which, a funny track. That came out actually during COVID that came out the April of COVID. So, but at that point, everyone was playing Hallelujah like for a year in advance. Yeah. So uh, we were at Creamfields 2019. I think it was Salado we were playing it and that's uh, how we first came to know your name. Uh, try to find uh, out, cool. yeah, who is, who's is playing that and Salado we were like, buddy, oh, that's a track and a half. I think that year Salado played it, Camel Flat played it, MK played it. Like it was just doing the rounds. I was super fortunate that like everyone was playing it, which meant that it did well when it came out. Yeah. Um rightly so, but it's a tune and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I I would be very I haven't even thought about this, but I w it would be very interesting if COVID didn't happen and what if it came out when COVID wasn't happening, what it would have done. Yeah. Uh, but you never know. Did you, um, did you, do you find COVID was a, like a productive time for you studio, studio wise? I really like, there's parts of COVID I loved. Um, I was super lucky. So it was my last show. Of, we had one show in Seattle council on the tour, um, which was like, the, it was like, patient zero in America. It started in Seattle. So that cancelled. And then the night after I had a show in Phoenix, um, Arizona, and it was like an outdoor party and they were like, we're going for it. Like, fuck it. It doesn't matter. Um, so Ryan called me. I was at the airport. I drove to the airport because I was going to fly back to Detroit and then fly from Detroit to England in like a couple of weeks. And then um, Ryan called me and was like, the guys want to do a party on the Sunday as well because it, they think it's going to be their last party for a while. So do you want to do a party Saturday night and a party Sunday? I was like, cool, yeah, let's do it. Um, and then literally 10 minutes later, he called me and was like, cancel that. Trump's going to close the borders down on Monday. You, you need to make a decision if you want to be in England or if you want to be in Detroit for COVID. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to go to Phoenix and then get the fuck out. I had to leave my car at the airport. So I had to call a friend from Detroit to go and get my car in, at the airport. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like I'm really lucky where I live in the UK is in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's in the countryside next door to my parents. So I got to see my parents every day. I cooked for my parents every single day. There was like ups and downs, obviously like, Financially, it's never the best, but luckily I was okay. Um, musically, I wrote so much fucking music. It was ridiculous. Um, I started the podcast, which was kind of a big thing that came out of that. Um, yeah, I think it actually probably ruined me more coming out of COVID musically, 
where like I didn't know what the fuck to write because I'd written so much mm. and I still haven't fully got into the swing of it again since um, I'm still writing music but I'm just trying to like work out where to take things and how to kind of move up rather than keep doing the same thing um, and just trying to like push so yeah it was it was it was a good good time for me if I'm honest um, and with the label we carried on releasing during COVID we didn't have any breaks releasing records we were doing one nearly every six weeks which is I just I love releasing music so I think it's the whole point it really this year we only released like three records we released a bunch of remixes but we only did like three originals and it was, it's just weird to me that like you're in the music industry like clues in the name release some fucking music um, <laughs> so how yeah. long have you been uh sort of djing and producing for like were you sort of growing up i mean obviously the culture over in the uk is a lot different to australia in the sense that i feel like the music the spectrum of music you're exposed to earlier is a lot more so did you get into it earlier or was it sort of when you're finishing school and going out clubbing or no super early i was djing I knew I wanted to DJ and when I was nine. I was doing <laughs> discos when I was nine. <laughs> I was mixing it at 12. That's sick. Born for it. Yeah, something like that. Were your, were your parents sort of get into it? Like, were they playing a lot of house and techno around the house? Or were you? No, no, not at all. But like, my dad listens to like punk and like rock, and my mum listens to like Eva Cassidy and stuff like that um, my mom is like a really good singer um she's like grade eight singer um my dad is not musical at all but has really good musical taste um so yeah, yeah like music was always part of my childhood but my dad took me to i was always into like chemical brothers faithless my brother bought home a cd like it was called dance 95 and it had like really you look back on it, it's like really shit, like dance, hard dance, hard trance, like Scooter was on there, like Scooter, move your ass. I don't know if you've ever heard that record, but it's fucking banging. You should check it out. <laughs> so, um, oh, don't no, continue. Yeah. So like, and then like, I like grew up listening to Fatboy Slim, Faithless, Chemical Brothers, Prodigy. Um, and then when I was, I think I was like 11, my dad took me out of school to watch, we went and watched Faithless. Um, and I, from then it was just like, we're on, I still have the poster from the night up in my like kitchen now. It's just like, yeah, just the one. That's unreal. So just on, um, like your early sort of music journey, do you remember your first gig and what that was like? Yeah. Yeah. I was 13. 13. Um, 13. <laughs> so I did my first time in a club was when I was DJing. I wasn't, I wasn't raving at all i kind of missed the whole rave thing because i the first thing was me djing and i never wanted to go to a club to rave i wanted to go to a club to dj um but i did like a dj course called a dj academy which is like a 10-week course thing that in the uk like this was i was i was 12 when we did it and then turned 13 and at the end of the course the whole point was like everyone learns how to dj if you couldn't already and then you learn how to put a night on you learn how to promote a night and you learn how to do kind of the whole branding of a night and then you will put you will dj um so yeah i remember the first time how to go my teacher, yeah my teacher from school came it's crazy. <laughs> that's bad it's mental yeah um yeah it was, well it's playing vinyl so it's like very different um so like I knew exactly what I was going to play. I kind of, it was just like, I can't remem remember the mix and I can remember like, I still have the records, but I, I can't like fully remember it, but I can remember the time and I got kicked out of the club because I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to snake some drinks in? <laughs> yeah. And like they, the manager knew I was 13 and they okayed it, but the security guard didn't. And he'd like, I was just walking around and he was like, get out. Like, oh. <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, was it like a sort of steady flow of gigs or when did you really start getting into getting regular gigs? Uh, 
it wasn't really regular, but we all kind of kept in touch. So, so like the people that were, that I did the course with, they're all in their like mid twenties, early thirties. So like we then started a night after that and we'd play like every other month um, together in Bristol. And then occasionally I'd be booked to play a little show in Bristol. And then I bought, so where I live, there's a, a, a town called, no, near where I live is a town called Western Supermare, which it's a bit of a shithole. Um, but it it's like a classic seaside British town, really. Um, and in that, there used to be a record shop called Spin Central. And in the southwest of the UK, which is where I'm from, it's very like hard house, or it used to be very hard house, um, hardcore. And also drum and bass is obviously like a huge thing with Bristol. It's like, it was like the sound. I was playing house then, like soulful, funky house. And um, in the shop, there was a girl at the time, she was called Miss Divine. Um, and I would buy my records from her and that turned out to be Sam Divine. Ah. So, I was, so I was like... Yeah, 12, 13, 14, 15, buying my records from her. And because there was nobody else in the area that was playing like funky, soulful house, like I'd just rock up like probably once a month. Um, and she'd just have a pile of records for me, like behind the booth, um, which is amazing. And then obviously we got close. Um, and I played a show for her in Western that's in a club that's no longer anymore. And that was when I was 15. And then she got a residency in Ibiza it's when I was 16. And she asked me to go and play out there for her for a show. Oh, so, unreal. Yeah, it's mad. Um, so I was, yeah, I was 16 when I first went out to Ibiza. <laughs> Cut a long story short. Oh, what are you doing at 16? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Seven, 17, I, I saved up. And when I was 17, I went out there for like, a month and a half, two months, and just kind of like got to know people really. Like I was never, I've never been a partier, so I don't drink. And even then I didn't really drink. I wasn't that fussed about partying. I was just like one track minded. How do I become a DJ like on a regular basis? Um, and yeah, so I cut a very long story short. I got in friendly with some people uh, that were at a they it was a bar called um orange corner which was like in san antonio which is like back then where everybody all the brits went it was like and this bar was next to a place called bar m which is, is actually now i beat the rocks bar uh, yep. next to beat the rocks bar um and orange corner like <laughs> it was owned by a guy called paco who is like the I don't know if he still is, but he's the biggest uh, dish, uh, importer of alcohol on the island and he bought it for his daughter. So it was kind of like a little bit of a play thing for them. Um, and there was just always crazy parties in the day, like all day long, because it was, they had, they owned the biggest part of the beach. So like everyone would be like sunbathing and it was pretty crazy. Um, anyway, when I was, the, the following year, um, the resident at the time got a, a proper job for tour room records, um, managing their tours. And he was like, I can't make it out there this summer. Do you want to be the resident? So I was like 17 years old, just about to turn 18. I turned 18 and then the next day, my residency started at Orange Corner. Oh, happy, uh, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. If I looking back at it, it's crazy. Um, and then, yeah, like it. That's when I became a proper DJ. Like, I think a residency really turns you into a proper DJ. How do you um, think it's sort of changed from then to now? Like the scene in general, but I suppose I'd be through as well. Um, it's changed massively. Social media started. Like Facebook had only when I was. My first residency, Facebook had only just kind of started going around. And it was like when 
uh, you'd add everyone as a friend just to like promote shit at them. You didn't even know. Like <laughs> even now on my Facebook, I don't go on it because there's like four and a half thousand people that I do not know. Like, none account. of them. <laughs> yeah, none of them are my friends. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was just like very different. Um, we were playing CDs then, so the vinyl had kind of gone. Um, and it was it was less about the headliner and it was more about the party. Um, don't get me wrong, especially in Ibiza, there was always headliners, but it was way more about the party. So you had a party called Manumission, which was this like crazy, crazy party that like, they did like live sex shows. They had like, it was like very Sounds like a theatrical. good time. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was very like theatrical. They'd have like crazy, like dwarfs on stage doing random shit. It was, it was very weird. Um, and then they had a party at space called We Love Sundays, which is every Sunday. And that was like the best party on the island, hands down. And it was 24 hours and the lineups were curated so well. Like it was, it was just amazing. And they had like everyone before they blew up. So like they had disclosure before disclosure was disclosure. They had like everybody, Claude Von Stroke before he was Claude Von Stroke. Like it was just the guys that booked, um, a guy called Mark Broadbent. And I forgot the other guy's name. They just, they killed it. Like proper killed it. And I feel like now it's more so not the brands. It's the DJs that, that people go and see. It's not the night. It's the like, oh, it, we're going to Black Coffee's night. Oh, we're going to Fisher's night. Oh, we're going to Calvin's night. It's like, it's very DJ headline driven, which that came out, that came out of the EDM kind of boom with like, I guess the headliners became rock stars to a certain extent. So just back on, like when you first got your residency, were you nervous back then? How did you handle like the nerves? Um, you, strike me as so a, you strike me as a cool, calm, collected kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think like, I remember like my first shows in Ibiza, I was shit in my pants. But like the resident like there was also like a level of professionalism that you kind of have to have where it's like you have to know what's what to do in every situation you have to learn how to deal with people especially in Ibiza because like you're on a beach bar like people get fucking wasted and they're literally like there um yeah I don't know I, I it was just a long time ago I can't really remember um but I yeah I'm not a nervous person when it comes to like playing shows. Yeah. And then, so from your residency in Ibiza, where did your journey go from there? Um, I was a resident and did some other jobs out there for I think three seasons. Um, and then I was like, okay, they, this is when the scene started to change a little bit. And it started to become very like more music focused where like you had to you had to write music to kind of get anywhere mm -hmm. during that time i was also going to college as in the uk so like between 16 and 18 i'd gone to music technology college um to learn music tech um so i was writing music then but i just wasn't that interested in it i wasn't that well i was interested in it but i like didn't know the importance i from like 21 to 23 23 I kind of like locked myself away in the studio like literally locked myself away I kind of split up my girlfriend at the time and was like right I just need to concentrate and really put work in um and didn't play any shows at all really just literally wrote music um and then I wrote a record called Big Booty which was like my goal was to sign to Dirty Bird Records at the time. And I was like, okay, how do I sign to Dirty Bird Records? And I was like, okay, cool. Like the reason why I wanted to sign to Dirty Bird was because I was, I loved the music they were putting out there. It was just like the most forefront kind of record label out there. They would, everything they did was like very different to what everyone was doing. 
um, minimal had just kind of stopped. Thank fuck. (laughs) Really bad and really like boring and really catty and Dirty Bird was just coming through with some insane music. Um, And yeah, so I was like, okay, cool. I can only see one way to become successful in this industry and that's attach myself to a brand and what do I need to do to attach myself to a brand? I need to write music that fits there. Luckily, I like the music that fits there, so let's do it. Um, I wrote this record called Big Booty. Barkley, aka Clover Show, didn't respond, but Worthy did. And Worthy had his, now she, her, her own record label um, called Anabatic. And um, she released it. And it just like blew the fuck up. But it didn't like blow up as like a hit, but it was like the Martinez brothers was playing it, Seth Troxel was playing it, MK was playing it, Eats Everything was playing it, Jamie Jones was playing it, everyone was playing it. And it was like kind of like a moment record at the time without sounding like a dick. Like it was it, <laughs> it was different to what they were all playing. Um and then I was like, this is crazy. And then Jamie Jones was asking me for records. He was asking for like an EP. And I was like, fuck. Like, <laughs> but that, that royally fucked my head. Because, <laughs> That's fair enough. But Jamie yeah. Jones, fuck. Because I was like, Jamie Jones wants me to write music for Hot Creations. I need now need to make Hot Creations records. But I wasn't kind of, I didn't understand like production and being an artist or anything like that. And I was like trying to write Hot Creations records and sending them to him. And he was like, no, they're not for me, not for me, not for me. And just like months and months of just like getting turned down, which you get used to, but I was trying to change my sound to fit Hot Creations. And it got to the point where I just quit music for six months. Wow. I was just like, this is fucking stupid. And I went to go open a club in Bristol and do that. Anyway, luckily I didn't. Um, but then cut a long story short, I actually liked, I had a manager at the time that was like, I'd pay him because I wasn't earning any money in music. So it would be like, a, I'd pay him on like a monthly. And he was like, I was like, mate, I'm taking six months out. I can't do this anymore. Um, and he's like, cool. And then literally like, the club fell through that I was going to open. And then he called me like the week after and was like, mate, defected are really interested in doing some stuff. Like we should, we should really get back on this. I was like, okay, cool. Anyway, I then signed an EP to like a bunch of things happened during that, but cut along very long story short. Like I signed an EP to Dirty Bird. Wow. Um, and that was 2014. No, I signed a single today but it was actually shit I don't know why Barkley signed um, it was really bad but he signed it and it was on the 15 year anniversary or 10 year anniversary one of them um, kind of like compilations and back then compilations are shit now like no one gives a fuck about them and they're just kind of a way for a record label to put out loads of music and give none of the artists any space to kind of talk about and not support any of the artists on that. It's just a way for record labels just to release as much music and kind of get as many artists talking about the record label. So it's it's not how it used to be. And Dirty Bird used to put the best compilations out because they'd be like five tracks, six tracks, and that was it. And they'd every track would do really well out of it. Um and then the following year, 2015, so, so the rec- first record, uh, he signed in 2014. And then I think it came out 2015. Um, and then I started, Barkley put me in touch with his agent in America. And that's kind of where everything started from there. Um, and I did three, four years at Dirty Bird until I was like, oh, I need to evolve. I need to do my own thing. And then I did a year of sign into like move into like a, the more European sound, I guess more European ish um, sign into like, that was when Adam Bayer hit me up and asked me to remix your mind. Try. Yeah. 
Dennis and Pika hit me up to kind of do some records with them. Um, and yeah, it just, it just kind of snowballed all of a sudden. And I think what it was, was my music was changing slowly and the like more techno guys were playing my records. Although I wouldn't class myself as a techno act. It was just like, it was like on the tougher side of house. It was, I guess it was like quintessential tech house, but not the tech house that everyone thinks of tech houses now. Mm. Um, and yeah, it was just, that was kind of the, towards the end of 2018, um, I did a remix for Rufus to Soul that was like very different to what people would know me as. Um, I also did a remix for U2 that was very different to what people would, would know me as. Um, I did a remix for Rihanna, which was like kind of a bit tougher. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of crazy year. Like I was, I had different management then, and they managed MK at the time, and um, they would just get crazy remix offers all the time. So it was just like great for me. But um, yeah, so and, and then kind of twenty twenty eighteen, it was it was actually like a really unhappy time for me because I was like going through that evolution of working out where I want to be. My team didn't really understand what I wanted to do, probably my fault as well, massively my fault, but also like I didn't really have any support from them. Um, and then end of 2018, it was like, okay, I need a fresh start. I need to get everything out. I need to get rid of all my team really and start, start scratch and kind of rebuild from there. And 2019, I took on Ryan and that was like the start of where we're at now. Was there a moment that you thought, like, I can actually make something of this as a DJ? Like, was there one defining moment? Would the Dirty Bird sort of time be that moment? No, when I was 12 years old. Right. <laughs> you knew right from the start. Yeah. I, I have nothing else. Yeah. Like, my, it was either rugby or music. What position and did I played, you play? Like, <laughs> what position do you think I played? I'm uh, sure. Oh, yeah, like yeah, a scrum half or something? Yeah, scrum half. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you um, any good? I, w I don't want to say that I'm good, but like I played, Could smash I played people, district, but... district, county, school. So you were good. I was like, it, it, yeah, not bad. Beautiful. But I'm like, I'm small as well. And I played a lot. So I was playing when I was, when I was 16, we were, I was playing two years up. So I was playing like 18, 19 year olds. Yeah. And when you're 16, like... I just getting battered all the time. So I, I injured my shoulder. I broke every finger in my hand, like broke my arm a couple of times. And you're just like, fuck this. Like I, yeah. I, I could never have got, I was never good enough to get to like international standard. And they would have looked at me and been like, who's this fucking dwarf on the pitch? Like it's not going to happen. Um, so it was just music. I have nothing else. I have no other qualifications. I have no backup plan. So it was like, okay, have to let's make do it work. It. Yeah. How do you yeah, think yeah. you sort of because you've got a very unique sound like in your productions, but as well when you play like I remember um I was at Ushuaia earlier this year when you played before MK and Calvin Harris. Yeah. And I remember thinking like the tunes you were playing, I don't think I've really heard them out by many other DJs that specific sound. So how long do you think that sort of took to like cultivate that and that direction of going with that sound? The whole of twenty nineteen was just me trying to work out a sound that I love and that nobody else is doing. And I know that like, it's probably not going to like hit off from the get go. It's like commercially not really radio friendly. Um, it's not like underground, but it's not like, it's not super cool, but it's also not commercial. So it kind of fits in this weird realm that isn't actually good for me because <laughs> it just like alienates everybody um but it was just like what works for me and it means that i can play 95 percent of my own music when i dj and nobody knows what it is and i think it's if i look at everybody that i look up to in the industry they all do that and it just takes time for them to get through to that. It's very easy to go and write a Fisher record.
but I'm not fish. So I'm never going to be as big as fish. It's very easy for me to go and write a Chris Lake record, but I'm not Chris Lake. It's very easy for me to go and write a Charlotte DeVitt record, but I'm not Charlotte. So what's the fucking point of being, trying to be somebody else when I'm not them? And I never will be and never want to be them. So it's like, who do I look up at that has their own distinct sound that eventually it could potentially cross over? It could, and I'm not trying to write crossover records, but it's like, you throw enough paint at the wall, something's going to stick eventually. True. Who would you say are your biggest musical influences? Chemical Brothers and Faithless and Gospel Records. So the stuff you're listening to and you sort of first got into it still today? Yeah, I think, I think like, don't get me wrong, there's some artists like Denson Pika, uh, unbelievable for me, like production wise, absolutely unbelievable. Um, super cool guys as well. Maceo Plex, just on another level. But I don't really look at anybody in the like the DJ world as like inspiring to me. And I don't mean that like I've got a lot of friends. Like that's not disrespectful to me. There's a lot of friends that are very fucking good. And there's a lot of people that I don't know that are very fucking good. But I like I prefer like Kems, Fat Boy Slim, old Fat Boy Slim, um, Faithless, where they're like making dance records that are records they're not just made for the club that's kind of where where i'm moving to now i want somebody to be able to do the washing up and still want to listen to my records rather than just hear them in a club um i want to ask you about so you've done a few um tours of australia now what do you, like, have you seen sort of any like differences over the years, like in the Massive. sort of Sydney or Australia club scene? Mullets. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> fucking everywhere. I think <laughs> every second podcast one. Fucking mullets and, <laughs> and shit moustaches. That's only um, that's only the last couple of years. It's just everyone uh, started last, growing them out. It's COVID boom thing. <laughs> yeah, mullets are fucking everywhere. And the platinum blonde hair as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's mad. Um, no, I think like... Um, it's weird where you, like, you find different pockets. Like what I was saying before, like, I think before, we, I think you're probably going to edit it out, but like my biggest shows used to be in Sydney and then it went from Sydney to Melbourne and now it's gone to Perth. And it's and also the most consistent place is Gold Coast. So elsewhere at the Gold Coast has been like the most consistent party I've ever played. Like I played there five times now. And it's consistently amazing. Mm. Um they need to update their decks and the mixer, but apart from that, like it's 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 good. Um but like Perth was just ridiculous. And the, the difference between Perth, the crowd was really young. Like mm. legit, like fresh. There was, def- there was definitely 17 year olds in there. <laughs> and it was like, it was amazing. And the, the like the warm up before me guy, he was like banging it out. Like I went and he was playing 135 BPM, <laughs> which like stitched up as fucking quick. I, I walked in with like, I don't know what the fuck to do here. Like I'm going to have to work this out. I managed to get it down to like 1.30 by the end of my set. But like, it was just a vibe. It was just cool. And I think like Australia, they have like a few people that they love and they just go hard on those those acts, which is amazing to see. Um, I just hope that I'm one of those one day because <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> you just have to keep coming back. Exactly. Well, that's that's the hardest thing with Australia is that every other market, the, the only real way to get big in a market is you either have a massive record or you tour regularly. And like with America, for me, it's been like I've been able to tour regularly and I've had okay-ish size records. Whereas like Australia, I can't tour regularly. No one can tour regularly unless you live in Australia. Um, 
and I haven't had any big records in Australia. So it's like you ha- you tour once a year because you have to, right? But it's then also like you're not being consistent to gain new fans. So like each time you'll gain like a few and your like your music will gain a few over the over the year before you go there, but it's still very minimal. And like yeah, I've seen a growth since I started, but it's still like not what it would be as if you were like regularly touring. Yeah. So speaking of parties you re- you've really enjoyed, what's been like your favorite parties that you've played at all around the world? Um, I love playing in Japan. Japan's fun. Japan. Yeah, it's really fun. Really? Uh, not any up. particular region? The parties aren't actually amazing, but it's just a so it's like what it's like another different world, like completely different world. And they don't really get house music, but there's something <laughs> really like naive about that that I love. And it's like no one really it's just different to everything else. So when you go there and you go to the club and you play, it's like they don't know what to do, which is amazing. Mm. Right. It's like, it's like when telling like a kid to go make a record and they've not heard any records, they just go and make something and it could be amazing. It could be a masterpiece because they, they have no influence. And I think that's the amazing thing with that is like the influences over there are just like none. Mm. So it, it's very interesting place. Also, Japan's amazing. Um, I did Colombia for the first time this year, which was amazing. I just like going to different places and just like experiencing different cultures. Um, and just like, like I played in Spain on Sunday, just gone, um, played at a place called Granada. And Spain, Europe just parties differently to the rest of the world, really. It's like the UK and Europe, they're pretty similar, but even Europe just is very different. Um, And like, you turn up, like I know like probably two people in this club knew who I was. Um, But you go and it's like 1,500 people just like there and it's packed and they all just go to party and I played four till seven on like a Saturday night into Sunday morning and they're all still there at the end. And like, that's where I like it because it's not a headline culture. It's like, we just want to listen to good music Mm. and we will go to the club every weekend and we will party every weekend. Whereas in the UK, in America, I think in Australia, like it's like very based on lineups. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think even um, in Australia, like, when people go out, they're not necessarily going for the music either. Like a lot of it's a social aspect. Whereas in the UK, Europe, people appreciate the music more and they're going because they like the music. Yeah, Australia is just about getting fucking... (laughs) Binge drinking and getting fucked. (laughs) Yeah. How many many pingers can you do in one night? That literally fucking rules in Australia. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. But I think like there's also... There's also a bit of a darker element to that, I think, which is like the escapism um, aspect, which you could go into. Um, but I think the difference in cultures is in, let's say, for instance, Spain, they still party hard, but they just party for longer. So they just they just party smart. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, in Australia, you have a lot of lockout laws and everything like that. So it's like you have to party till you have four hours to get as cunted as possible (laughs) and then in Spain you have all day and all night so Mm. why do we need to like let's pace ourselves like let's do like have a few drinks have a few pills over like 12 hours rather than all in two and a half hours it's very different yeah I think people just aren't like used to it either like if we go to like we're talking about Sash before they do a breakfast party as well and that goes through till um, like midday the next day, and it's just yeah. full of Europeans and South Americans. Just like the few yeah. Aussies in there, but it's just yeah, it's all because they they're used to it. They know how to do it. Whereas Aussies are like, oh, it's four o'clock bedtime. It's not bedtime. <laughs> Ten o'clock for yeah, you. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> it's like these boys. They go to bed at eleven o'clock. Oh, <laughs> throw the glass. mate. Please save your breath. So I you, think it's awesome. Got you. Go. You're very, right. 
I think it's very different cultures. So like, and I didn't know why well, I, I kind of did, but I, Australians have, I know they like to party, but majority of the population from what I gather from the outside is about having a healthy lifestyle. Like say for instance, I got a friend that lives in on the Gold Coast and she was saying that like people are up at like 4.30 in the morning to go to the gym. They like go to work super early and they finish their day early and go to bed early. And it's just like a complete different like mentality. Whereas like you look at Spain, they like might turn up to work. <laughs> they they then have a siesta for like an hour and a half and then they chill out for a little bit and then go back to work and then have dinner at like one o'clock in the morning and the whole yeah. family's out. Like grand, grandparents, whereas like in, in the UK, in the, in Australia, like everyone's, no one's out after nine o'clock eating. Like everyone's eating at like six. We were shot past like eight o'clock, 8.30. Yeah. All yeah. Sort of places. Yeah, when we yeah. when we were in Spain and I think was it in Madrid and they're eating it. It was like eleven thirty at night. We just come home from the football yeah. and they were eating then. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like restaurants were all closed and everything by then. Was happened there? Because, yeah. He's got one of those shit moustaches, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he needs a real beard like you. Speaking of the beard, how long has that been going for? I've had it for like nine years now. I think I got it trimmed actually today. What, what's the uh, what's the care for? Are you putting shampoo what's in that thing secret? every day? <laughs> uh, shampoo conditioner, like a couple times a week. Yeah, um, I'm scared that I haven't got much of a beard compared to yours, but I haven't seen my face in about four years, five years, and I'm scared to do it because I'm like a little boy. <laughs> do it. I reckon if you lose a bet, yeah. you might have to. Yeah, I'm gonna have to make a bet with someone. That's the only reason to get it off. Will it grow back quick though? Yeah, it'll grow back in about two weeks, but probably yeah. a bit. Fuck. I had a shitty mo before. Uh, had it for Mo Movember, and then yeah, mum wasn't happy. No, you didn't. You had it for way longer than me. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> that was his excuse. He started growing it in June before <laughs> November. Got, got a couple of whiskers going. That was about as far as I could go. Went out in the wind and it blew off. <laughs> it was, yeah. I think it was, was it coming back from Europe 2019? You had that dirty mo. Got told I look like Freddie Mercury at like DC sex, 10. Sex I think we're, at, we're in the smoking area at DC 10. Some lady said I look like Freddie Mercury. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was a compliment or not. Probably not. We'll take no, I don't it. know if that is a compliment. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. I don't yeah. think so. If you're out there and listening, Bye. shame on you. <laughs> so you run your own podcast as well, uh, which you mentioned before that you started during COVID. But something mm. we picked up is the guests aren't necessarily involved in the music scene. So how do you sort of curate that? And what's your sort of vision with what you're doing there? So it's very easy for me to just do music scene people. And it has majority been music people. Um, but I just like talking to people that have like done cool shit. So we had like Monica Xamet, who was like a bronze medalist fencer for the USA on... Um, James Haskell, who's like used to be an England rugby player. Um, we had a guy called Zevi G, who's this like crazy artist who did this like huge NFT drop, but also he's like a big sculptor dude. Um, and it was just, I just, I had one of my really good friends. He's also like quite a famous chef called Gregory Gorday. He's was been like on American Top Chef a couple of times and has his own restaurant in Portland. And he's like, I just like getting creative people on that can talk about what they've done and just also just chat shit. Um, the podcast kind of, I think it's probably the same with you guys. Eventually, like it just turns into a chat. Mm. rather than like asking questions and stuff like that. And it's like just usually a two-way conversation, which is way more interesting um, to me. So it's just like getting people on that I'm interested in and just having a really good conversation. The most recent episode was a girl called Joplin who's like this super young uh, singer, songwriter, producer from Berlin. And like I will, I'd never spoke to her before. I like her music, but I'd never spoke to her before. And Sometimes when you're going into a conversation, you're like, I don't have a fucking clue. What, like, <laughs> I don't, I don't have questions. So it's just like winging it. 
And um, we had like such a good conversation and I really wasn't expecting it, but it's really nice when you have those conversations and you come off the, the episodes and you're like, that was fucking good. And I don't care, like selfishly, I don't care if anyone else likes it. It was just good for me. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that's, um, it's weird, the whole podcasting, because it's like you have to be consistent. So we do it like every week a new episode comes out every week and it takes a lot of time up. Um, and I've just taken on an editor. So I've done like 144 episodes and I've edited wow. with a video done everything myself. I was about to ask that uh, if you did it all yourself, like how you sort of squeeze that into your, like image traveling and everything else. Yeah, it was rough, man. It was it was really rough. So when, I, when it started, I told my manager that I wanted to start and he was like, cool, just do it, crack on. Like he was like, I don't really want anything to do with it to start with. You just go do your own thing and work it out. Um, and then he did, um, or I did, and I was booking it. I was editing it, and I like the first one was done on an iPhone. Like, mm. it, like I didn't have a fucking clue what it was. Like I was literally just recording on an iPhone. Um, there was no video; it was just audio. Um, and then it kind of evolved and. Yeah, now, yeah, I think I've recorded like 147, 48 um, episodes and it's just been signed to Virgin, which is really interesting. Um, it's still like very niche so, and I want to broaden it. I want to make it out more to the, the masses and that just is down to me getting bigger artists, uh, more broader artists, Um Zane Lowe is like my favorite interviewer ever. Uh, I don't know if you know who Zane Lowe is. Can't say it, uh, Okay, you guys should check him out. He's he was he's a Kiwi. Um, so the cooler version of you boys. Uh, oh, shape uh, shaker. <laughs> <laughs> Taking hot shots, man. Yeah, hot shots from seventeen thousand kilometers away. <laughs> um, he we started on Radio One. Um, in like the specialist spot, um, which during the weeks, which was Monday to Thursday, like seven till nine. And he's a very good D radio DJ, but he was like renowned for like finding new artists. He was like the, the new John Peel, but his interviews for artists were just on another level. Like they were, he did like Kanye West, the first like two, three big Kanye West interviews. He did like Jay-Z, Eminem, um, he did everyone or at Radio One. But then Apple, he did a deal with Apple at Beats. And he's like does every like just YouTube Zane Low, Billy Eilish, or something like that. And then just all of the Beats ones. They're very good interviews. And I think the goal for me is like I don't want to be an interviewer, but I want to be able to like be in person and sit down with like some of the biggest people, creatives in the world, whether that's an artist, whether that's a singer, a songwriter, producer, PR agent, photographer. Um, I just want to be able to like have a really good conversation with them and just dig deeper into their lives rather than just like the surface level stuff that a lot of interviews are about. And if it's two hours long, it's two hours long. If it's four hours long, it's four hours long. It's like, there's no kind of limits on I think the podcast world is that's the amazing thing about podcasts we, we've been so used to like interviews being edited over the years and it's just like here's an hour and you're only getting an hour and yeah some people just want to listen to 30 minutes of that but if there's four hours some people will want to listen to the four hours and I think it's like just give the people an option to have more yeah there's going to be some some gristle that you want to kind of <laughs> Out maybe but like that's the whole point of the ebbs and flows of a conversation that some it, it's not all gold if you know what i mean yeah I take my hat off to you as well because doing it by yourself is a lot harder than like we're, obviously we've got three of us here and we put yeah. a bit of time into have made an effort to be listening to sort of at least two or three a week but just sort of listening to how people do it and taking bits and pieces about how they talk to people and that kind of thing it's important I yeah think. i think i think Obviously, podcasts are kind of the new fashion over the last like two, three years. And I just think in the music industry, it's classic artist people is that 
they're just not necessarily consistent all the time because we like like to do new things. And I think what I saw was like it just there just needs to be a consistent something consistent all the time. Um, and that's how things do well. Um, you look at like Joe Rogan, for example, he's been doing like three a week for 15 years and you're like, yeah, that, that it makes sense why it's so big. Um, it's just finding the niche for me as well. It's like, it's, I'm still nowhere near where, where I want the podcast to be, but and yeah, it would be great to have more numbers and it would be great to have like people sponsoring it and doing all of that. But like, it's just good conversations and they will be on the internet for the rest of our lives. And I think also one of the things for me is like, especially in dance music, there's a lot of the the founders of dance music that are still alive and no one's having conversations with them. And I just wish like we would learn from like the past is that like there's so many people like artists that were founders of their trade and no one ever spoke to them. And I think it's like, how do we learn from them? How do we, how do we create new founders of new genres and, and, and kind of allow the, allow the like new generation to understand where everything came from. And I think like that's one of the main reasons why for me is like the amazing situation we're in now is that these conversations can stay on the internet forever now. Who would be your dream guest to get on your podcast? That's tough. <laughs> fuck. I'd really like to get Maxi Jazz, who he was part of Faithless. Um, he was like the singer and kind of rapper dude from Faithless. Um, that there's guy. a lot. Sorry? He's that guy, the voice. Yeah. So he's the one. Somnia? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. That'd yeah. be pretty sick. That's iconic. Uh, and there's, there's a bunch. I'd like to get some non-musical people on there as well. Um, I don't really Chemical Brothers would be amazing but they're never going to do it unless I turn I like they don't even do Zane Low so if if, they, if you're not doing Zane Low it's fucking crazy you never know I've got like a, I've got like a short list of like I've got DJ Godfather coming on who's like absolute legend um, Jesus is, what's going on in the background I thought that was yours. Yeah, I thought that was yours. It's probably our car getting towed. <laughs> yeah, fuck. Gordon, Gordon Ramsay, what about Gordon Ramsay? Yeah. But yeah. That'd be good. He actually follows me on Instagram. Oh, right? no way. <laughs> fuck, that's the highlight of your career. Gordon Ramsay following you. That's peak. I don't know why he follows me. Um, but yeah, I think like, for me, it's not about like any one specific person. It's just like having, I'd love to like in 10 years time have go like, fuck yeah, we've, we've spoken to some of the coolest people um, out in the industry. Yeah. It's really actually fun talking to like new, new kids on the block because their perspective is so different to like the old guys or even mine. Um, it's just so different. The conversations. What about you guys? I think I'd say probably one of the biggest influences on us, like, because we sort of started partying around that time that, like, Solid Grooves was getting really big. That was around that time. And, like, so you I wanna, suppose... You want to get the monk on, don't you? Hey? You want to get the monk on, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'd say... That's doable. I'd That's say, very doable. Say, yeah, like, Baby or someone like that, because, like... Yeah, they were, they were probably like from the start. They were, and also I feel like Salado would be pretty cool as well because that was the first. I think as the on the corner EP. Um, yeah, that was like the first track that I heard of like dance music tracks where I was like, oh, it's like I really like yeah. that. And then from that, I started going sort of deeper into it. So someone mm. like that that had like an early impact on you, I think it'd be pretty pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah they'd, be, they'd be cool guys. They'd be it'd be really good conversation to actually hear that as well. BB's done some stuff for a long time. He's put the work in. Same with Salado, but BB's 
like with Solid Grooves and where he's at now is just on another just, level. Yeah, where um he's coming out in February. Uh, he's playing at the Ivy. Um, we're supporting him. We're in the second room, but um, oh, yeah, so we're, we're, thank you. We're pretty stoked for that. But we'd love to yeah, get him. On cool the, venue as well. Yeah, they've they've done it. I'm not sure when you were last there, but they've done it up what in the last year and a half, two years. So they've up the ante there. It's pretty cool. Everyone's pretty approachable. That's the amazing thing with social media now is you can just DM people. Yeah. Like, I know a lot of them don't look at their DMs, but you never know. It's worth it. Well, that's worth the thing. Try. Like, when we even we reached out to you, like, we'd seen a few times you'd interacted, like, if we post a, a mix and we tagged you or whatever. So we thought, oh, who, like, who'll who reply? Like, even if he says no, he'll at least reply. So we thought, you, yeah, you were probably one of the more approachable ones. But yeah, like you said, you can sort of, that's the good thing about social media. You can just reach out and don't ask, you don't get. Yeah, don't ask, you don't get. Like, yeah. it's. Simple as that, you should really. you should really hit up like all the agents. You should hit up Paul and everyone like that, mm. and just be like, guys, we've got a music podcast in Australia. Like, we're trying. We can help promote tours. Like, if you can help us with with artists, that would be the way I would do it. That's one of the things we noticed, and like one of the main reasons why we want to do a podcast. Like, we the, uh, there's really not anything dance music wise, mm. at least in Sydney that I'm really aware of. So he thought like it's a good sort of market to tap into sort of shine the light on Sydney and stuff. And we thought it's definitely... It's Australia in general as well. Mm. Like, yeah. Obviously, you've got yours. There's a couple others. I think, was it... Uh, not Jocko, I was thinking of because he was on the... He was on Josh Baker's. Syntho one. There's a couple of others, but like, yeah, in Australia, I can't think of any that sort of... And any that are standing, mm. like standing out anyway. Scuba has one. Scuba has one that's pretty good. Um, you have like... A a thing called tape notes, which is really good. But oh, that's it's like, mad with like Loyal Kano yeah. and people like that as well. Yeah, yeah, it's really good, but that's a little bit out of our world. Um, yeah, there's not there's not many. No, really. that's it. And even, yeah, but like the, the people we're getting on is people we're genuinely interested in speaking to, like your guests as well. Yeah. Like we're genuinely interested in what they have to say and hearing their story and like taking advice from them. So it's win, 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 really. There's no... No that's, how, that's how Claude Von Strike did it. That's how Claude Von Strike, if you go listen to his RA, um, RA do a really good on Resident Advisor, They, but it's not as consistent. Um, but his, how he did it, he went and interviewed like all the top DJs and was like telling them that he's making a documentary and he was getting it filmed and everything. And then he worked out, he was pretty much asking them, how do you do it? And then he like was like, okay, cool. This is what I've got to do. He's done, like, well. yeah. He's done well. He's done well. Do you understand it's late so we won't keep you too much longer? Um, so w- what's next for Will Clark? What's your 2023 looking like? A lot of music. We're trying to do a release every month um, and we're dotting remixes in between there as well. A couple of remixes I've done this year. Um, probably this... A lot... <sighs> I don't think we're going to be do, doing as much touring, maybe. I'd like to. Um, but we're kind of trying to limit ourselves with the amount of touring we're doing in certain territories. How many, um, sorry, just to jump in there, how many shows are you like do you hit a year? This year I did sixty seven. Oh. As in, do you want to stick in that sort of range or do you want less? I'd if if I could, I would do hundred and twenty. Like I'd I'd love to. Um I'd love to do more, but I also... So the way it works when you're like an artist, like the way financially it works, like I could probably do 120 to a certain extent, but financially it's not necessarily going to be worth it. And I'd just be losing way more money than what I'd be making. So like with taxes Um, and stuff like that? Taxes, cost of travel, um, paying everybody... Um, but like, if I was like BB Fish, the big guys where they're earning a small fortune every single show, then yeah, doing 120, 150, 160 shows a year is very financially lucrative. And there also comes a point where you, if I was to do it at the level that I'm at, it's not, I don't want to kind of like, sound like I'm just trying to make money, but it's like I'm you're also fucking yourself because mm. you're traveling so much that it stops all creativity and I won't be able to write music and 
it just it would be counterintuitive for, for that to happen. I'd rather spend more time writing music and writing the the right records and waiting for the touring to come to that point than than uh try and go mad touring and yeah because like like i don't know if you guys and uh, like know that the way finances work but i think it's really interesting how people the people should know is like let's just just keeping it very simple and just keeping it very simple numbers if you were to do in america the way the tax works if you're a foreigner you get withheld 30 percent. so if you earn let's just say you earn 10 grand a show okay which sounds great your three grand of that goes straight away before you even see it. Your agent then takes a grand for because they're ten percent. Your manager takes fifteen to twenty percent. So let's just say you take fifteen hundred out. That's like over half already. If you have like a business manager, they take five percent of gross. So that's gone already. And then out so out of that, you then if you have a TM, you have to pay for their flights and hotel. I don't, but I think it's a waste. But some people do then you have to pay for flights and hotels and sometimes marketing so like out of a 10 grand show you're coming out with like a couple of grand mm -hmm. which although like a couple of grand is still fucking amazing but you have to get to the point where you're worth 10 grand in the first yeah. place yeah. so like let's say for instance your first tour you're earning two grand a show you're walking out with nothing. Mm. So it's like, <clears throat> it's a very, it's like a catch 22 with, with touring. You have to do it, but it'll, you also kind of have to have a bit of cash to kind of support you. Yeah. Like if you boys were to go do a tour of America, like it's going to be fucking expensive as a trio. Mm. Which is great. In the room. I'll sleep on the floor. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> And yeah. don't get me wrong, you have to do what you got to do yeah. when you're when you're starting out. And like, I'm fortunate that I do earn pretty good money. If you know what I mean, it's not the best, but I earn good good finances. But it's taken me eight years to the point where I am earning reasonably good money. Um, and then on top of that, you have everything else you got to pay for. Yeah. So like, you have like if you're getting branding done, like to go get re stuff re like to get good branding, you're talking at like 10 grand. Fuck. It's, it's like, it's expensive if you're trying to like really build an artist career. Mm, plus like um, you said as well, like the taxing, like you said, you don't party too much, but obviously there's that side to it. A lot of DJs do. Like if you're flying city to city, lit minimal sleep, like on repeat for weeks on end, it's going to take it out of you. Yeah, so. I've, I've got a lot of friends that over the years have missed a lot of flights. And that costs a lot of money. Like, I won't say names, but like one of my good friends, he was, this is a few years ago, I think it was 2019, he was headlining a festival in LA, played in Dallas the night before, missed his flight because he was absolutely fucked up and then had to get a private jet. Oh, fuck me. Dallas, LA, because and that cost him twenty six grand. Oh, did he say he would have lost money there? Surely <laughs> he probably he was still making good money, oh, okay. but like he's a big guy. <laughs> but like if you're like twenty six grand or five hundred quid, yeah, mm, yeah, big, di big difference. Like it's a big difference. That's like half a year's mortgage for some people. Yeah, it's fuck a lot of money. Right? Yeah. So it's like, and if you do that on a regular basis, it's it it adds up, and and I think it's like, oh come on, you got to, the the clues in the name is music business. There there's business somewhere, and you have to take care of business before anything else, because otherwise you just be fucked. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the whole goal for it is to be doing this for our jobs, right, for the rest of our lives, um, and. I think if you do it intelligently, it, it can. Um, it's just a, you just have to do it right and have to do it smart. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Really. Thanks for coming on. Well, well, thanks. I'll have, no. have to book you for a party. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Bring you back. Yeah. Let's, even when I'm in town, let's go for dinner or we'll just do another podcast. But I'll be <laughs> yeah. in. 
Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Thank yeah. you very much. Sounds Thank good. you. Thanks, Thanks Laz. You. Big no love worries. for you as well. Cheers. Thanks, man. You can dance. Dance to the beat. Dance to the beat. Dance to the beat. Beat. You can dance to the beat.